Hi everyone, uh, and um, apologies for for that. Um, you've had the the silent version uh, of uh, Manga Sebastian uh, today. To sum up, uh, he is uh, welcoming you to uh, HM conference and reminding you that uh, as well as a conference, HM uh, is a, a journal uh, which comes out four times a year. Um, uh, bringing together about 1,000 pages of uh, Marxist theory and history uh, a year uh, and urging you, in fact, if memory serves, he demands uh, that you uh, subscribe. There is currently a, a discount uh, if you subscribe to the website, and I would very much encourage everybody watching uh, our broadcast today to, uh, to do so. Um, he also uh, was reminding you that uh, HM, uh, alongside Brill uh, and Haymarket, uh, runs a book series uh, which uh, spans hundreds of uh, different uh, monographs dealing with questions of Marxist uh, history, theory, and debate, uh, and that currently uh, Haymarket is running a 40% uh, discount throughout the conference uh, on the entire uh, HM book series. So now is the time uh, to go and uh, enjoy a sort of progressive uh, shopping spree uh, if you haven't done so uh, already. Uh, okay, so welcome to this uh, session on Marxism and grassroots politics. Uh, my name is Sai and I'm an editorial member uh, at HM uh, and I'll be chairing uh, today's uh, session. I'm joined uh, by a number of uh, brilliant speakers who will uh, introduce their papers for about 10 uh, some of them pushing to 15 minutes, uh, after which there will be time for you to ask questions uh, uh, and engage with the speakers, make remarks, etc., which you can do throughout their talks uh, in the chat. Uh, so, you know, feel free to, to do that as they're going if you, you know, don't want to forget the kind of the questions or, or comments that you'd like to make, and I'll, I'll read them out to the speakers uh, in the second part. I will briefly uh, introduce our speakers and then hand over to them. So we'll start with um, the uh, paper by Dante Philip and Matthew Lee, uh, both members of Pagliati Rossi. Um, Dante is a graduate student uh, and uh, Matt a uh, teacher. Uh, their paper today uh, is titled The Political Prospects of Student Inquiry. They will then be followed by Ian Allenson, uh, who is a UNITE activist and execu uh, executive member of Manchester TUC, where he co co I can't speak anymore. I apologize. Uh, where he coordinates industrial action. Uh, Ian will be followed by uh, Lucille Franchet, uh, who is a PhD student uh, at SOAS, uh, and her paper will be titled "Flexibilization Policies and Labor Market Structures uh, in France." And finally, um, Charlie Post, uh, who is uh, both a member of the Tempest Collective uh, and a member of uh, the Spectre Editorial Board. Uh, will present a divergent path, the impact of opposition to the no strike pledge in the United Rubber uh, Workers between 1940 and 1960. So I will hand over to Dante uh, and Matt first, um, who will kick us off. And uh, like I said, uh, please make sure to post your, your questions and comments in the chat box um, throughout. Dante and Matt, the floor is all yours. Hi. Thanks, Sai, for that great introduction. Um, so today we'll be presenting um, our paper on political prospects for a student inquiry. Um, and the purpose of this paper is to sort of ask where today do we lie students in relating to the cycles and texture of workers' struggle involved in the UK uh, and how we can bear down upon class, political and social movements uh, with regard to this. Uh, and we suggest that by means of a student inquiry, uh, the student movement, which is marginalised and largely directionless, despite recurrent bursts of militancy, might be revitalised uh, if we follow Ed Emery's prag pragmatic demand, no politics without inquiry. Uh, we want to understand the work and labour that's unrecognised, obscured and unwaged uh, that students do for their institutions and more broadly the state. Uh, and we believe that the necessary starting point to do this, again, is inquiry. Um, so We'll start this by overviewing the historical and critical basis um, for a student inquiry uh, before continuing on to discuss questions 
which we believe would act as a useful starting point uh, for this project. Uh, so student inquiry is a term that has been coined as an extension of uh, the political practice of workers inquiry, uh, which is a general term of a long history, um, arguably beginning with Marx's own survey of 100 to 101 questions, depending on who you ask, uh, which aim to understand the current work condi conditions uh, of the working class from their own perspective. Uh, workers inquiries in different forms have been used in a number of different contexts uh, since, such as with the Forest John Tennessee in the US, um, or socialism and barbary in France. Uh, however, it's with particular reference uh, to the tradition of operismo or political workerism, as it's been translated into English, uh, that we'll discuss works inquiry uh, in relation to our proposition. Within operismo, works inquiry was developed as a political practice uh, used in conjunction with class composition analysis, uh, that being an analysis which aims to understand how the technical and social composition of workers, i.e how workers organize and the material organization of workers uh, with regard to their social reproduction, uh, how that influences uh, working class groups um, and the working class in general in their political composition, which is the manner in which uh, the working class is self-organized. So therefore workers inquiry is the political practice by the working class that is used to both understand their own class composition and intervene in their collective political composition. Um, the practice of workers inquiry has taken on forms outside the workplace. Um, this includes women's inquiries, which go back as, at least as far back as Summer James and Philomena Daddario's uh, women's place inquiry in 1953, as well as territorial inquiries that focus on the social composition uh, of working class communities and how they're housed and organized outside the workplace. Um, we believe these previous examples show that it's possible to engage in inquiry outside formal workplace environments, uh, especially if you want to recognize that other spaces, uh, there are other spaces in which work is being done to reproduce capital. So it's in this manner that we believe in expanding the practice of workers inquiry to our current context in the education sector uh, as part of a student's inquiry, uh, which aims to understand and intervene the class composition of the student population. There's historical precedent for this sort of activity. Um, if we particularly look to the 1960s in Italy, um, students aim to look at the shifting role of universities in society, uh, the productive activity of students uh, and the fault lines within the student population itself. Uh, examples include sort of Guido Viali's Against the University, um, which was distributed to about 20,000 students nationwide, as well as the manifesto for a negative university that came out of uh, the newly founded Sociology Department in Trento. Uh, which was the center of uh, shifting class composition within the student population uh, back in 1967-ish. Um, further on, we can also see how this sort of student inquiry uh, occurred with the Wages for Students campaign and other literature coming out of the journal Zero Work in the US. Um, so therefore, these movements that we refer back to as proof that a student inquiry can be a political useful tool uh, and a strategy for contributing to the working class, the self-organization of the working class more generally. Um, we also believe there's a theoretical basis for this inquiry. Um, and there's proof, concrete proof, that students uh, take part in socially productive and productive uh, activity within our current economy. From a socially productive viewpoint, students are the workers and also the bosses of the future. Uh, and the existence of schools and universities serve the purpose of reproducing these social forces and therefore by extension intervention within these spheres can disrupt or alter the production of future workers. Students aren't simply a useful social force for revolutionary activity due to the amount of free time they, they supposedly possess or just because they are a revolutionary subject in and of themselves. They are, or at least a large section of them, are important due to their position as workers of the future. Uh, therefore, political inquiry and, invent and intervention into student populations is important uh, for the process of building a militant consciousness and networks for the workers of the future. However, as well as a socially reproductive role in society, students and the institutions in which they exist and relate to play a produ productive role in society. Universities sell student work. Uh, they use students often through the free labour of the internship, 
for research and teaching work. Uh, and more broadly, they use a social and cultural life that students create on campus uh, as capital work for the promotion of the university and its brand. On an even simpler level, who sways with the student population in the UK work in addition to studying an estimated two thirds, uh, according to a recent survey. We need inquiry to explore these things more concretely. For example, how are the expansion of programs such as uni temps amongst student populations increasingly affecting the relationship between students and the universities? Which workplace and industries have a significant student worker presence? What specific functions do students play in the research outputs of universities? What work do students do for the state more generally? It's through inquiry that these aims uh, that aims is through inquiry that we aim to answer these questions uh, and act upon those answers. So we can create an alternative image of student life uh, than that of which the university and schools currently feed us. Uh, and one which reveals the flows of migration and labor and the productive and reproductive roles they play for the global economy. Answering these questions is also key to understanding the decomposition and recomposition of student work. And subsequently, workers arguably as an area uh, and subs ah, excuse me. <laughs> so answering these questions in terms of decomposition and recomposition is important, arguably, for a comprehension of the student movement as a whole and any sort of political project that takes place within that student population. Uh, cheers, Matt. Um, so I'm just going to briefly carry on with some of Matt's comments and then also articulate more concretely how we envision taking an inqu inquiry project forward. So as Matt has expressed, an expansion of inquiry into the student population needs a certain degree of justification. The tool requires stretching and reconceptualizing when considering a population like students. But if we recognize that fundamentally students are engaged in productive work and that they're in a vital sense, the class composition to come, we think a student inquiry is a valuable and legitimate tool. Um, first of all, we recognize that inquiry offers an alternative way to politicize and engage students rather than relying simply on the traditional forms of organizing on campuses. Rather than seeing students as simply an extra wing for the parliamentary left or local campaign groups, we can adopt the class political perspective, which recognizes the unique political situation students actually lie within. Um, given the university has its own image and particular way of knowing and understanding the student population, we are com commodities to be tracked, measured and disciplined, so as to ensure the reproduction of the labor force necessary for capital's um, continuation. Um, we need to then ask, what is the task for student militants in responding to the, student, in responding to the university's particular ways of capturing student existence? So the student movement is often relied on a particular discourse for rendering the university in political terms and attempting to see the university as potentially socially useful as a way that we can um, also narratives of recovering the university as a space for radical pedagogy, as a space for free expression, as a tool for organizing and forging an emancipated future. While we recognize that this kind of discourse plays a certain role in mobilizing students, these kind of rallying cries are also um, potentially quite weightless and abstract, not grounded in an understanding precisely what sense the university is actually like a factory, as the common saying goes. So we must then as students, to use Moten and Harney's phrasing, come to reckon ourselves, recognize ourselves as the problem for universities. We must politicize our own existence in a particular way, in an alternative way to how university understands us as students. And the best way to start doing this is to actually understand the way in which we do work for the university and for society as a whole. Um, so the original wages for student campaigns um, understood the university in a particular way, in a particular conjuncture, but we recognise we're in a very different conjuncture, in a, um, in a very different political scenario, where it's digitalisation, internationalisation and massification which students now confront, rather than the original stages of neoliberalisation in the university that something like the Wages for Housework campaign we were facing against. Um, so to conclude, we'll just outline some of the themes we hope to address in actually engaging an inquiry project. First, we need an inquiry to understand the current composition of students on a class and economic level to determine how they um, shape the political activity currently happening on campuses. We can have a better class political understanding of, for example, the waves of anti-racist anti militancy, feminist organizing and the student rent strike movement. Um, this means we can actually understand that like um, the participants of these movements and the limitations of these movements due to where the class um, situation of participants. Similarly, we can kind of pursue the standard workerist line of analysis of how, how are these radical movements being subsumed, pacified and integrate, integrated back into the state and back into the university. Secondly, we recognise that new forms of disruptive student politics can be, reckon, can be discovered through actually seeing what work university students are doing. Anyone who's been involved in student organising knows that there's a standard arsenal of 
occupations, picket line solidarity and half-hearted integration into universities institutions. But we can, if we actually understand the work students do for universities, we can understand better what forms of refusal, which forms of withdrawal might actually disrupt the university in new and fundamental ways. Um, we think an inquiry can also offer better analysis of how students are situated within their cities and within their campuses, understand them as renters, understand their kind of broader socially reproductive status they have, um, which means we can then better start drawing in student struggles into the campus and drawing them out, better relating um, citywide and nationwide struggles within the university. Finally, we think the most important question we need to address in an inquiry project is what has prevented greater solidarity between students and workers in over now half a decade of UCU struggles and more localised campaigns. Why is it the peak of student militancy, which we identify primarily um, on a class political grounds in, within the rent strike movement, why did that never fully overlap with the UCU's movements? What was preventing greater um, class political consciousness between students and seeing themselves as workers alongside UCU workers on strike? Um, so we recognise this, we basically pose a series of questions which we hope to be addressing in the inquiry. These are the original framings which we think are necessary for doing an inquiry project. As with any workers inquiry, it's only once you start doing the detailed and slow work that you can actually find out the avenues we need to pursue. So um, if anyone's interested in engaging this project further, we'll put our email into the um, chat and you can follow, and we hope to be writing this up into a formal statement, theoretical and practical, um, in the next couple of weeks. Thanks very much. Brilliant, thank you so much, uh, Dante and Matt, for, for kicking us off. I'll now pass on to, to Ian. Uh, and not only did I stumble over Ian's description, I also forgot uh, to give the title of his presentation, uh, which will be Go Northwest, Britain's longest bus strike despite lockdown. Uh, Ian, the floor's all yours. You're muted, Ian. Uh, that's a rookie error, isn't it? Um, let me just uh, get that going again. So, uh, yeah, earlier in the year, we had the longest bus strike in British history, lasting nearly 12 weeks in Manchester. Um, as Sai said, uh, you know, I'm a United activist, but I wasn't directly involved in the strike. I was involved through the Trades Council and as a local socialist organising solidarity uh, uh, with the strike. I think it's a strike that really illuminated quite a lot of the issues that were uh, thrown, thrown up by the state of industrial relations in Britain at the moment, um, and also uh, some of the issues caused by the government's response to uh, coronavirus. Uh, so it's worth talking about some uh, basic facts about the, uh, about the dispute. So the employer, uh, part of a, a big uh, multinational company based in Britain, um, and uh, the trigger for it was uh, a thing called fire and rehire, uh, which is all the rage in Britain at the moment. The TUC estimates that more than one in 10 workers in Britain have been faced with this uh, since the start of the pandemic. And what this involves is the employer basically saying, we're going to dismiss you unless you accept worse uh, paying conditions. Uh, and they uh, uh, did impose a contract uh, that was uh, dramatic worsening and which also tried to uh, restrict the union's ability to bargain uh, in the future. The outcome um, was widely trumpeted as a tremendous victory uh, by uh, the union, and you know th there were some important wins in there. Go ahead, promised never to use fire and rehire again anywhere in the world. So you know that's not bad for one depot going on strike. Uh, the imposed contracts were torn up. Some disciplinaries were dropped. A couple of workers who'd been sacked were offered reinstatement. But the deal was a compromise. So United had gone into the dispute offering quite significant concessions uh, and the deal went further than what United originally offered. And since the strike, and I'll come back to this, the majority of the reps have actually left the company uh, and members are feeling quite, uh, quite dissatisfied. Um, so there's a link at the bottom there to uh, an article I've written with a, a bit more detail about that if uh, people want to see more. Um, some elements of the struggle, uh, there was a very impressive picket line, probably the best organised one I've ever seen, uh, with, uh, as it says, you know, big marquees, lots of uh, facilities for people and a very high level of strike pay, which was undoubtedly incredibly important to enabling the strike to last as long as it did. Uh, there were some interesting tactics from the employer too. Uh, Go Northwest didn't try to run scab services out of the depot itself. 
uh, but they hired some space at a local um, warehousing centre, the Hayward Distribution Centre, uh, and tried to uh, run services out of there. But they also paid other bus and coach companies as subcontractors at a cost of over a thousand pounds a day per vehicle uh, to um, uh, to run scab services. And the significance of that is that in British law, workers aren't allowed to pick it other than at their own workplace. So the employer is allowed to move the uh, uh, allowed to move the work. The workers aren't allowed to uh, allowed to follow it. Um, the other significance is that the law in Britain also bans an employer that's facing a strike from hiring temporary agency workers to cover and scab on the, uh, on the strike. But by subcontracting the work, the subcontract companies were allowed uh, to do that. So they were circumventing uh, the uh, strike law. So as well as the pickets, um, workers didn't feel confident because of the legal position. Uh, to go and pick it where the uh, scab services were running from. So a big part of the community solidarity, as well as the more traditional postering marches and rallies, was operating blockades of the depots that were running scab services, uh, and even uh, briefly one of the go-ahead depots in, in London. And then towards the end of the strike, uh, there was a Unite Leverage campaign, um, and that included uh, pressure on Andy Burnham, who's the mayor of Greater Manchester, who was uh, changing the way contracts are awarded for buses in Greater Manchester in the near future to try to get him to promise not to award contracts to companies that engaged in fire and rehire. That didn't succeed. Um, and crucially, uh, Go Ahead was bidding for a mega contract for rail services in Sweden. Uh, and the campaign did manage to successfully threaten that, taking advantage of the fact that fire and, he fire and rehire uh, would be illegal in, in Sweden. So that didn't go down so well over there. Uh, this is an example of uh, the community blockades I'm talking about. Uh, <coughs> so, um, uh, if uh, supporters stood in front of the depot gates, uh, they were often told that it was interrupted the highway and threatened with arrest. Um, uh, so, they adopted a tactic borrowed from uh, anti fracking environmental protesters of what we call slow walking. Uh, uh, which, uh, as you can see, the police uh, couldn't find a reason to uh, to, to stop. And uh, every time this happened, uh, buses were held up by typically up to an hour. So this proved quite a successful uh, tactic for causing uh, causing disruption. Um, a little bit on the impact of COVID. Um, uh, when Go Ahead first proposed worse terms and conditions, um, very few of the reps were actually in the workplace because of uh, because of COVID. Some some people were driving, uh, but there were very few people in the depot. Uh, some people had been furloughed, so weren't in work, and so that made it very very difficult for people on the union side to communicate uh, and, and take decisions. By the time the strike actually started, England was in a national lockdown, and that lasted through to uh, 29th of March. And there was no exemption for protests, so it was uh, uh, quite a serious offence if you were in a, a, a gathering. And the police used that to threaten pickets, so if there were um, more than a handful of pickets uh, outside the depot, the police were saying that's not allowed under the COVID regulations. So most of the strikers had to move uh, to another location uh, that was uh, not quite so visible uh, in order to continue, uh, continue gathering. And the community action that you just saw an example of, uh, there was an exemption in the COVID rules for daily exercise. So nobody was uh, able to openly organise the solidarity. Um, uh, it had to be done with individuals just saying, well, I'm choosing to take my daily exercise here. And, you know, what, what a su nice surprise that some other people are doing it at the same place um, and the same time. So that was kind of a slight game of cat and mouse with the, uh, with the police over the... Um, uh, re uh, repressive elements of the COVID rules. And of course, even after the 29th of March, there was discouragement of using uh, shared cars or public transport. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously the protesters wanted to keep safe and keep everybody safe as well. So that limited the numbers of people who could uh, take part and what activities uh, people could do quite significantly on top of the impact of having to organise covertly rather than openly advertise uh, solidarity actions. Unite discouraged leafleting the public for most of the dispute for um, what, you know, in hindsight, certainly misguided COVID safety reasons. We know that it's um, uh, ventilation is the key issue rather than contact. And then uh, COVID also had an impact on making it very difficult to do what we would call delegation work. So groups of strikers traveling to other workplaces, 
either locally or, or around the country um, in order to raise uh, raise support. And uh, that delegation work sim simply didn't happen. And one effect of the smaller numbers involved was it increased the uh, uh, the risk of violence from supporters of the. Uh, oh. and, uh, Don't hit it. Get your fucking hands Give them time. I'm going to respond rather than showing you more. But hopefully, you get the idea. Um, some of the lessons um, I take from the strike. Uh, firstly, the use of messaging apps was vital. Prior to the strike, the uh, workers had relied overwhelmingly on face to face communication in the depot. Uh, during the course of the strike, they uh, used uh, an app called Band to get themselves on. So they were able to rival uh, the employer house an app that they require all the drivers to use to, to be able to communicate with the drivers. So the union had its own to, uh, to rival that and keep uh, getting information out and uh, keep people communicating. There was clearly a problem that the union's commitment to keeping the employer competitive drove concessions. And we're, we're still seeing this, I think, in a number of other disputes going on, uh, going on at the moment uh, where um, irrespective of the strength or weakness of the workers, the union's committed to making sure the employer uh, is as profitable as possible. Uh, as I mentioned, the employer was able to lawfully move its services, but Unite was not able to lawfully picket them, which is uh, clearly outrageous. We had a problem that most of the companies being used to offer SCAB services were not unionised, and that clearly made it much harder to stop uh, the SCAB services. Um, when it came to the leverage campaign, uh, those have been done in different ways over the years. And in this case, it was uh, Unite centrally with its own resources, its own staff, uh, implementing the leverage, putting pressure um, on rather than involving the workers in doing that um, themselves. And that left the workers very vulnerable to pressure to accept a deal uh, at the end that was clearly fell short of what many of them hoped for. So there was a substantial yes vote for it, 78.5%. But the key argument workers felt is if they had continued the strike, um, they weren't confident that Unite would have continued to provide the support they'd had up until that point. So that lack of independent organisation was a real problem at that point. There was conflict within Unite about putting pressure on Labour mayors like Andy Burnham in Manchester and Sadiq Khan in London. Um, one of the candidates who didn't win the um, uh, Unite General Secretary election condemned that, said we should be supporting them, not, uh, not criticising them. For not supporting uh, supporting members, um, and probably I think the most important issue was there was no attempt to encourage parallel action at other depots. So uh, it's not lawful in Britain to have solidarity action, but there are ways to work around that. So, for example, if workers at other Greater Manchester depots run by other companies had taken action at the same time, there would have been an incredible over their own issues, there would have been an incredibly strong position because there wouldn't have been any more scab vehicles, uh, subcontract vehicles available, and it would have magnified the pressure on the mayor to intervene. Similarly, if there'd been action at other go-ahead depots elsewhere in the country, the company was spending millions of pounds already trying to break the Manchester strike. So the failure to try to organise uh, action in parallel at other depots, uh, I, I think was a significant weakness. Um, possibly connected with that, the United officials focused on what proved to be pretty unproductive talks uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks um, uh, during the strike. And they felt unable to implement uh, leverage during the, um, uh, sorry, excuse me, but get rid of this phone. Um, um, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, uh, they, they, they um, uh, didn't prepare to reballot. So uh, after 12 weeks, the legal protection uh, for industrial action is much, much weaker. Um, so uh, if the strike had continued, that would have caused a problem with workers having to briefly return to work before going back out again. Um, on a more positive note, the community solidarity networks have actually continued organising solidarity with other strikes. So actually what was built up during this strike um, has left uh, a legacy. Um, I, I know I'm uh, pretty much at the end of the time, but I'd like to just very briefly give the last word to the strikers because I think that's uh, always a good thing to do. I'm 
Barry and Tops and I'm a bus driver at Go North West Depot in Manchester. Just after Christmas, we were given an individual meeting each and told to sign a new contract or we would basically lose our jobs. It's also known as fire and rehire. So the outcome regarding the fire and rehire is we've actually won. My name's Colin Hayden, uh, I'm the convener here at Go North West Depot, part of the Go Ahead group at Cheatermill Depot in uh, Manchester. A lot of the stuff uh, within the proposals is, is, is unknown to the, to the wider public, but what it was, it was a clear attempt to put the, the union in a box and, and nail us down within the workplace, where our rights to challenge, our rights to collectively bargain were literally taken away. We were unwilling to be sacrifices for, for no, no other reason than for shareholders to get a little bit more profit at the expense of all working people. And we, we thought and we felt that it was important enough that this fire and rehire be challenged because it wasn't just us, it's affecting everybody. The repercussions of this would have affected even my children down the line, so I'm, I'm glad to have taken part in this. Well, I'm somebody that suffers with a, uh, you know, a life-threatening condition, um, so for me, um, having my sick pay reduced was a big no-no. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a lifeline, something that I, you know, I relied on, and it's something that I never abused myself. So to have that um, um, remain intact is, is a big win for me. Thanks very much, uh, Ian, uh, and I'll uh, pass on straight away to uh, Christian. Um, hi everyone. So my presentation is going to be about uh, labor market flexibilization policies in France from a class relational perspective. So this work is part of my PhD project that I'm currently working on at SOAS. So quick introduction, I'm first going to go through what flexibilization policies mean, then I'm going to look into the French labor market to then explain why flexibilization policies in the French context, context is particularly interesting to understand. So what does flexibilization mean? I'm pretty sure I could ask this question to maybe 10, 15 different people. They could be economists or not, that all give me different answers. And the reason for that is it's been used so many times out of context that the term winded up meaning everything and nothing at the same time. So here I've got a quote by um, Guy Standing, who is pretty much trying to explain what the mainstream economics mean when they talk about flexibilization policies. And it's, it's essentially policies that make it easier for the labor market to respond to shocks. So often these economists will create a list of variables that they call labor market rigidities. So these include policies such as minimum wage, um, unemployment duration, high unemployment benefits, high collective bargaining, um, high union density. All these things are essentially here to protect workers' rights. And so the mainstream literature and is basically kind of like attacking these things. And here I've kind of like, summed up the literature into like the two main blocks of the neoclassical economics, the mainstream literature, and the sort of like post-Keynesians and more heterodox economists, but not really the Marxists, which basically all have this theoretical framework and then proceed to do an econometric analysis, which serves as a positivity bias. So the mainstream economists say, okay, Flexibilization policies um, increase unemployment and they, um, they, sorry, they decrease unemployment and they foster economic growth. So the econometric analysis is gonna show exactly this and vice versa for the post Keynesians. Um, so what I take out from reading all this literature is, well, first of all, we can't empirically prove that these economic policies are actually increasing employment or increasing growth. So why do we implement them? And second of all, all these literature, all these 
studies that have been done, they always compare different countries together. But then it's important for Marxists, for the Marxist literature to intervene and say, well, actually, these policies take different place over, t- take different forms over different country and different times. So now I come in with a new question rather than asking, what does flexibilization do? I'm going to say, what is flexibilization? So I'm taking a Marxist perspective on this, and I see uh, flexibilization policies as capitalism rewriting the rules of the system during the 1970s profitability class uh, crisis. So it's essentially a capitalist class struggle to reproduce an exploitable labor force and increase their capital accumulation. So now, more concretely, what does it mean? Um, so I'm, I've, I've taken the, the example of the French labor market, not just because I'm French, but also because it has this reputation of always going on strike and having a very strong union movement. And I'm not saying any of this is wrong, but when you show even economists this graph, they are very surprised to see that So if you look at the x-axis here, you can see union density as a percentage. And France is actually on the far left of this graph. So France has a union coverage that is just on the 10%. In Europe, there's only two countries with a lower union density, which are Estonia and Lithuania. Okay, so then if we look, for example, if we look at the y-axis, this collective bargaining. So collective bargaining in percentage is the uh, proportion of workers in the country that are covered by collective agreements. So you can see that most countries that have low collective bargaining coverage, they have also low union density, like for example, the UK or the US. And if you look at the Nordic countries that have a high union density, they also have a high collective bargaining. And you can clearly see that France is an outlier in this graph and it seems very peculiar that France has a very low union density and a high collective bargaining. So why am I saying that this is relevant as a flexibilization policy? Well, actually, I just said that flexibilization policies take different form over time and place. And collective bargaining, high collective bargaining is usually seen by mainstream economists as a labor market rigidity. In the case of France, it's actually a covert flexibilization policy. So this is pretty much a timeline of my PhD, but looking even before this, it's quite important to understand the um, history of the French working class. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail before uh, about this, but just before the neoliberal era started, you have May 68, which is essentially the peak of the capitalist crisis in terms of realizing that workers are beginning to be more and more class conscious and starting to actually like getting solidarity and actually threaten French capitalism. So French capitalism actually needs to react to this. And there's basically two ways you can do it. You can do a Thatcher style reform and completely repress unions, which in France is not really the approach that they want to take because, um, well, they're really scared of the uprising that could happen if they do this. So the French capitalism is is going to come to the conclusion that if they want to implement flexibilization, which they have to do because it's now the new uh, economic policy for labor markets under the neoliberal era, they have to do it by negotiating with their workers. The problem is, remember that union density is really low here. So how do you negotiate um, with workers when union density is low and you don't want to give more power to the unions? Well, by increasing collective bargaining, as you can see here, after the 1960s, collective bargaining has started to increase dramatically and is now nearly at 100%. So what happened is that the government slowly rolled out a series of laws. Here I've I've put two examples. 
the oral laws are like is the first of this series of laws that are going to come. Um, it's really important because it's going to decentralize collective bargaining to the firm level. So what happens when you do that is essentially workers who are not union reps have received no training at all are now in a position where they have to negotiate the contract, their pay, their hours, and they don't know how to do it. And they often lack the resources and the sort of like organizational power that a union usually comes with, such as whether it's organizational tools or even having contacts within unions and being able to build solidarities. So basically, I think it's also important to uh, understand that this whole thing is more of a process that is happening. So all these things on the left here, so for example, weaker union, like the increased firm level bargaining had to be implemented because we have weak unions, but then the increased firm level bargaining creates greater flexibility. Increased firm level bargaining also weakens unions even further and reduces uh, union density because workers now don't really need to be in the union anymore to feel represented at the workplace. So this happens, then weaker unions leads to greater flexibility. So you can see there's a whole process happening where each factor affects each other and everything is in motion. So just to sum up with this, um, I just want to say, so these are all the policies that France have implemented that are kind of like covered and aim to um, keep workers complacent with the capitalist system, but also make them feel like they're being heard off when really all these policies have done is concentrate the power in the hands of CEOs and managers. And later on in my PhD, which I've not covered here, I'm going to look at more overt flexibilization policy once the covered ones uh, have been implemented and they have successfully um, reduced workers' power. All right. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Lucille. Uh, and we'll now move to uh, Charlie. Uh, and um, again, let me just encourage participants to post their questions and comments in the chat um, while the presentation is ongoing. Charlie, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, this is a presentation of sort of the basic thesis of a work book I'm working on, on the United Rubber Workers in the US between essentially the mid 1930s and the late 1950s. And what I, the book is an attempt to make an, to address an ongoing debate among social scientists and historians on the transformation of industrial unionism before and after the Second World War. There's a, grow, there is a consensus among most social scientists and historians that the war marked a turning point. Before the war, the wave of struggle that produces the Congress of Industrial Organization, the CIO, took the form of a militant social movement with very radical political potential. It was born and out of a wave of mass illegal and highly disruptive strikes, between, starting with three general, three citywide general strikes in 1934 and culminating in the winter and spring of 1936, 37 in a wave of factory occupations, the sit down strikes. These in the, after that, you see continued contestation of control over the workplace through, not through the grievance, the bureaucratic grievance procedure, but through short, what are called quickie strikes. You also see political manifestations that in many industrial cities, particularly in the, in the Midwest and in New England, you see CIO unionists trying to build independent workers or labor parties, breaking with the Democratic Party to party. After the war, the CIO looks very, very different. It is more centralized, more bureaucratic, and much more conservative. In the post-war period, you see annual strikes, which give way in the 50s to strikes that take place every three to five years that all remain within the bounds of legality. The, we see the grievance procedure basically displacing direct action on the shop floor 
dur over, during the so-called life of contracts. And the labor movement is tied by the late 40s, early 50s to the Democratic Party and to the U.S.'s post-war imperial project. Now, there are two basic divergent interpretations of this. On the one hand, mainstream sociology, et cetera, see this as an inevitable process. They, this line of argument can be traced back to the work of two former Marxists, Robert Michels on the German social democracy and Selig Perlman on the American labor movement. They basically flip the Second International's teleology of class consciousness from trade unionism to revolutionary socialism with a new teleology of inevitable bureaucratization and de-radicalization of both workers' organizations in the production and of their political parties. In the 1950s, this is updated and applied to the US situation by another ex-Marxist, Seymour Martin Lipset, who along with Lester, Kerr, and others, basically argue that the evolution of the CIO, which is hothouse during the Second World War, when the CIO accepts the no-strike pledge for the duration of war, basically relies on federal mediation through the War Labor Board, et cetera, as an inevitable process of the integration, institutional integration of the CIO and the working class into industrial societies. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, this is challenged by a layer of historians influenced by the new left. Two most important sort of people who begin this discussion are James Green from the Radical America Journal and Nelson Lichtenstein, whose dissertation, which becomes his first book, Labor's War at Home, argues that this is not an inevitable process, but instead a process of a highly conflicted political conflict between an officialdom during the war that seeks institutional stability and a place in the wartime economy and the planning of a post-war welfare state in exchange for the surrender of workplace militancy and political opposition. This process, they point out, is highly contested by what they call the union cadre, the layer of local officers, many of whom are not full-time officials, stewards and others backed by very rebellious informal work groups, which fight, which contest both in practice and politically the no strike pledge. They see, in, they see that with the defeat of the union cadre, we see, do see after the war, industry-wide pattern bargaining, stabilization of unions in Northern and Western heavy industry, but no welfare state, the surrender of the South as a non-unionized area, and the inability to organize clerical workers. And while workers in the US experience rising wages and benefits through the mid 1970s, this form of bureaucratic, bureaucratic unionism was completely unprepared for the employer's offensive during 19, from the 1980s on. Now, what I'm trying to do is add an element, add, to bring a comparative analysis to this debate to show that in fact, to try to highlight how this, the outcomes of these contested political processes during the Second World War determined the trajectory of the CIO unions. And I'm, the book, while it focuses on the rubber workers, also looks at the largest of the industrial unions built from below the United Automobile Workers, the UAW. Now, both of these unions are built from below, rebellious shop floor committees, often led by radicals, semi-skilled and other workers, basically through direct action and massive disruption, bef all before the passage of the National Labor Relations Act, create democratic and militant international unions that have a foothold in the basic, in the major, major mass production industries in the United States. The big difference, which would, will show up later, I believe, which is part of my analysis later, is that in the rubber workers, the Communist Party has a much smaller presence than that they do in the UAW, which, which while it means that in the period of the mid 30s, there's less role of political radicalism as the Communist Party conservatizes and becomes the main force enforcing the no strike pledge during the war, the 
it gives a very different pattern to the UAW and URW after the war. And at the post-war period, we can see clear divergences. The UAW politics after the war is dominated by the communist controversy. And if, despite claims of some recent historians and sociologists, the Communist Party led locals within the UAW and Communist Party led unions within the CIO generally actually had, were as conservative in their workplace presence as the, excuse me, the non-CP led unions. You see an international, lead, the struggle in the post-war period is all about which side to take in the Cold War. International leadership in the UAW completely controls national bargaining, demands, strike dates, et cetera. And it progressively moves over, over the years to three to five year contracts that give international officers control over any possibility of local strikes under working conditions. Now in the rubber workers is a very different trajectory. Unions politics strict, according to Business Week in 1948, focused solely centered not on the communist issue, but strictly union issues, the defense of unauthorized strikers and the need for national strikes against the rubber companies. The local unions, in particular the largest locals in the center of the industry at Akron, control national bargaining through the bargaining chains. They formulate the demands, they carry out strike strategy, and ultimately the Akron locals have veto power over any contract. And wages, well, there are three-year cycles by the late, by the 40s of negotiations one year, wage negotiations one year, benefits negotiations the next, and local negotiations on work worlds the third, stri strikes remain a possible, annual strikes remain a reality through the mid 1960s. Now the biggest difference that I found between the UAW and the United Rubber Workers is the level of unauthorized wildcat strikes in the two industries from the war, through the war years into the 50s. And you can see in this, uh, graph that in both in terms of the blue line is a database that a graduate student of mine and I put together. And then one is uh, the other red line is company data compared, the green line is uh, auto wildcats in this period. You can see that there's a much higher number of strikes consistently through the mid 1950s in the rubber industry than in the auto industry. And this is just to sort of give you a really clear idea, the URW was about one tenth the size of the auto workers at the height of their membership in 1943, about 150,000 compared to 1.5 million. As a result, worker participation in and the frequency of unauthorized strikes was much higher among rubber workers than auto workers. One estimate says that about 20% of all auto workers participated in wildcat strikes between 1947 and 1959, compared to over 90% of rubber workers. And while there are only 1.3 unauthorized strikes per 10,000 auto workers in this period, there are 4.8 per 10,000 rubber workers. Now, the roots of this divergence, oh, sorry, I got to the, all right, I'm at the end, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. My argument in the book is that the roots of this divergence are in the relationship of forces between the international officials during the war who are firmly committed to the no strike pledge, firmly con committed to, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, firmly committed to the War Labor Board, the alliance with the Democratic Party, et cetera, and the union cadre in the UAW, only a minority of local officers and, and, and stewards oppose the no strike pledge. Divisions within the international leadership between Ruther's grouping and the CP backed Thomas Addis group allow the, in, during the war, the intercorporation, the subsumption, as, our, as comrades might put it, of a significant layer of the Union cadre into the Ruther faction, which becomes the dominant faction after the war. This ultimately in the post-war period leads to a dissolution between of the alliance between local officers and the union cadre, the stewards, the informal work groups, et cetera, and their increasing integration into the international officialdom. In the rubber workers, 
the weakness of the Communist Party has a paradoxical impact. There's no room in that union for a middle Rutherite group that attempts to find a middle ground between support and opposition to the no strike pledge. And what you see is that the leadership of the largest, the Akron locals, what becomes known as the Akron progressives after 1943, um, excuse me, lead a, one of the large, proportionally largest and most politically unified oppositions to the no strike pledge in the, in the CIO. They lead a citywide wildcat in 19, May of 1943. They come within 20% of the national convention of overturning the no strike pledge. And they actually attempt to expel the president of the union after he has expelled 100 wildcat strikers. And that this alliance, my argument is that this alliance between the local officers, the stewards, the informal work groups, which marked the pre-war period, continues through the mid 1950s and in some places into the 1960s in the rubber workers. Thus, my argument is an attempt to support Lichtenstein's argument that it was a the process of bureaucratization of the CIO was not an inevitable process, but a process of a contested political process that led to the defeat of the union cadre, the militant minority. And that it is, yeah, so that's the whole point of the book. And if people have questions, I can go on for hours. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Charlie. And I, I, I salute your, your self-discipline there uh, at, uh, at the end. We've already had a, a couple of uh, uh, remarks and, and questions, so I'll, I'll put them to the chat now. Uh, Theodore is asking, uh, I assume uh, Dante and Matt, but you know, anybody who feels like uh, responding, how do I learn to do a worker's inquiry? Um, there is a, a comment from Isabel Plorite, who I assume um, is for Lucille. Belle présentation, merci beaucoup. Uh, and uh, Panagiotis, uh, is asking Lucille as well, the various waves of social and in particular labor unrest in France, 1995, 2006, 2016, uh, to what extent did they affect the evolution slash dynamic of flexibilization? Um, I haven't had further comments or questions, so I'll uh, maybe ask for our speakers to start responding to those uh, and give people watching more time to um, type their, their questions. Um, so maybe Dante and Matt, you want to go first? Yeah, well, I guess um, answer that question. Um, I would also love to know how to do a works inquiry. I think it's hard, it's hard to say how to do it because I, I think it's a living thing. It's a political practice um, that you undertake. It's not particularly something that you can um, achieve and say, here, I've done it. Uh, not something that you can say, um, I'm going to work in this place for six months and I'm going to take this step and this step and this step and I'm going to, you know, produce a works inquiry. Um, I think if you're interested in works inquiry uh, and engaging it as a political practice um, that involves, um, you know, starting from where you are, um, thinking about like your role uh, in the global economy, um, how your work links up with other workplaces, uh, discussing this stuff with the people you work with um, or people who work in other places um, and yeah just simply existing as a militant um, in your workplace and contributing to that to a shift in political consciousness um, to a shift in collective reflexivity uh, in response to collective consciousness um, and maybe eventually that'll, that'll lead to writing something maybe writing something would help contribute to that um, but yeah, I don't think there's any particular method or way of, of, of doing works inquiry as such. Um, and I think it's already been linked in the, in the, in the description, but um, yeah, notes from below is a good resource to check out if you're interested in this stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have anything to add, Dante. No, summarize it nicely. The historical precedents are useful, but works inquiry is precisely meant to be reinventing itself continually and for each workplace. And as we are expressing in our talk that it's kind of necessary to expand workers' inquiry to think beyond the traditional conceptions of the workplace and into 
broader conceptions of work and how capitalism reproduces itself. So if you start doing a works inquiry, it's just as legitimate as any other one, as long as it's militant. <laughs> Thanks both. Uh, Lucine? Hi, uh, thank you. So uh, about the question on the different labor unrest in France. So I think it's a really interesting question because that's actually something I look at in my PhD. Um, I look into more details at the 2016 um, unrest because that, I've made a whole chapter that's going to be a case study on this. But just to quickly address uh, the other movement before 2016, as I said, I think they're a bit more covert, but for example, like the 1995, which is um, the national insurance uh, reforms, um, there, were, there was like a, a large uprising following this. And something that I note while analyzing that is that the unions were really, really divided during this time and their cracks are showing. And this is, also something that I found really interesting and that I look at, especially for those of you who know a bit about the French unions, you have two big unions, one of them which has more revolutionary roots and the other one that has more reformist roots. And these unions can never agree on anything. And one always kind of like winds up taking the side of the government. So for example, during this reform, um, the more reformist one was actually for the reform while all the other unions were kind of like protesting it. So this is a major issue when you have a really low union density. And on top of that, one of the major union doesn't support the workers. Um, when it comes to the 2006, and also I think the 2010 strikes are really important. Um, I think 2006 is more about uh, all these uh, precarious contracts that um, they try to implement for young workers. And there's been a history since the 1990s where every, I don't know, five, 10, yeah, maybe five years, they try to implement a precarious contract just for youth. And every time they fail and they try again, they fail and eventually, of course, they manage to um, make uh, young workers um, into a precarious situation. Uh, actually, youth unemployment was and is still a problem in France um, because of these reasons. And yeah, I think 2010 is actually when I think maybe French capitalism realizes they they probably have succeeded in, in this covert approach of the flexibilization policy because 2010 was the retirement reform. And this marks the first time in decades that all the unions are actually um, protesting hand in hand. So, and it's it's one of the biggest uh, strikes of um, of the decade in France, and they failed to obtain any concessions on that. So I think then you realize, okay, so all these covered policies that they've implemented for uh, weakening workers, they're actually working because even with a, a united movement, they've not managed to achieve any concessions. And this is why I think 2016 is really interesting is because the government is implementing a flexibilization package that is essentially called the uh, labor laws, which is a bit of a rewriting of the German heart reform. They've inspired themselves also from the Italian flexibilization policies. And they just fall on like overt about it. And there were big movements, a lot of strikes, a lot of protests during a few months in France, which essentially didn't really lead to a change, any major change, at least, uh, in the law. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hope I answered your question. Amazing, thank you very much, uh, Lucille. We haven't received uh, further questions uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, in, in previous uh, sessions, we've also allowed uh, presenters to you know, raise questions for each other uh, if they are so uh, moved, which you can uh, absolutely do uh, in the chat. And while people uh, think perhaps about questions, uh, let me just remind our viewers um, that uh, during the conference, we also have um, uh, discounts both on the journal uh, and uh, on the book series for Haymarket. And so for our viewers, please to 
uh, use that. Uh, Ian would like to ask Charlie a question. Ian, please go ahead. Yeah, I was struck by that graph you had of the um, uh, unofficial strikes between the two industries. And I was wondering how you'd discounted the possibility that different production processes might have played a part in that. I, I think often unofficial strikes are strongly linked to very localised bargaining. And obviously, I know I, I don't know much about the rubber industry, but automotive industry has a very linear production process where a few people stopping, you know, can stop thousands of people and has, you know, very broad implications. How, how, how have you discounted that as a possible alternative explanation? Well, I would say, first of all, I want to get some more data on Wildcats, quickie strikes, et cetera, in the pre-war period in auto, because a good 60% of auto workers prior to really the 1960s were, in, were working producing parts. They weren't working on the assembly line. When Ford, and this is the pattern that after Ford sets up, the Highland Park plant. About 40% are unskilled workers working on the assembly line in a continuous flow. About 10% are tool and die makers, the skilled machinists who maintain and set up the machinery. But about, about 50 to 60%, depending on the plant, are semi-skilled workers working on machinery, which they control the pace of. And in fact, automation, when if, this is a point that Lichtenstein makes in one of his articles on auto worker militancy, Automation is initially not complete elimination of workers, but to take workers who are on machines producing parts and have the machine become self-acting and set its own pace rather than the workers. Now, in the rubber in, and in those workers tended to be up until the 40s, mostly piece rate workers. The rubber industry, there are some continuous flow activities, but even there, as in mixing of rubber, mixing raw rubber to fight in that is those uh there's fairly high levels of wildcats there but it is clearly in the two the two main places that wildcats are concentrated or um tire making which actually until the two thousand this century remained basically under the control of semi-skilled workers they start and stop their machines and their level of skill really affects whether they produce junk or not. And then the other place is in the curing rooms. Now in the curing rooms, they do be automate the process of curing the tires, hard, vulcanizing, hardening them. But I think, and the industry does remain for the most part, a piece rate industry. But one of the things I didn't get a chance to mention is that what you see very clearly in the rubber industry through the 50s in the US that you do see, according to Jeffries and others in the British auto industry, is a level of workers control taking the form of what David Montgomery called the stint or the bourgeois sociologists of work would always call restriction of output. There were studies done starting during the war when there was a, when the Akron plants weren't delivering tires for the military on time. This guy, Simonetti, who becomes a, who goes on to be a professor of business at the University of Ohio, goes in and tries to figure out what's going on. And he continues these studies. And what he finds is basically, and, this, and there's evidence of this even in the pre-union era in the tire rooms, workers all agree that they are going to produce X number of tires. Anybody who produces more will be socially isolated or in certain circumstances, have the shit kicked out of him. And this spreads then to other, other departments. So for instance, in the 50s, he found that in a department, predominantly women working on piece rate, producing rubber heels and soles for shoes, every single one of them, day in and day out, shift in and shift out, produced exactly the same number of soles or heels. Because they were very clear that if you did exceed if you had rate busters, management would come back by lowering the piece rate and increasing the production standards by, through speed up. So I'm, I am not convinced that it's given many people's misconceptions about what the auto industry is and reducing it to the assembly line. 
that was both industries you saw workers working on machines controlling their own pace. And then in the 60s, from the mid 60s onward, you see lots of wildcat activity on assembly lines with, you know, uns you know, because again, small number of people can disrupt things. And I think this, if you look carefully at the actual labor process, not some of these idealizations that conventional sociology came up with and that unfortunately many people on the so-called left basically then attempt to explain rather than interrogate, we find that there are workers still have and small groups of strategically placed workers do have capacity to disrupt. I mean, that was in the auto plants, that was clearly the parts workers and it was clearly the skilled machinists, the tool and die makers. In the, in the rubber plants, it was the curing rooms and particularly the tire rooms. Thanks so much. I, I'd like to ask a question both to, to Dante and Matt and then also one to Ian. Um, I guess to, to Dante and Matt, I mean, you know, maybe I'm just part of the kind of traditional analyses of students that you started with criticizing, but so I'd, I'd like to push you a little bit. I wonder how what you're saying is different than to say students are also workers, right? So your analysis sort of depends on saying, well, many students work, uh, many students are renters, so there were important rent strikes, etc. What's not clear to me is why that uh, says something about the kind of social nature of students, which you appear to sort of be, be raising. Uh, as a kind of a specific group that might have particular forms of activity kind of tied to it, et cetera, rather than saying many students are also workers and therefore should be organized, understood, spoken to as such. Um, which, you know, is obviously, I think, important then for the, the question of, of inquiry, given the, you know, the, the logic of the workers' inquiries to say that it's workers as workers who play a particular role in the reproduction of you know, capitalism, et cetera, and therefore need to be understood, organized, uh, pushed towards militancy, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and I guess sort of linked to that, I'm surprised that you see the, the high point of student activity as the rent strikes in the kind of last decade rather than the kind of 2010 uh, movement. Uh, but, but again, I, I, I might be showing my, uh, you know, Whatever I, I don't know what the word is, but you you know what I mean. Uh, and then to Ian, um, I guess that was a, a, a. Oh yeah, that's depressing. It's not the last decade anymore. Um, my I'm I'm confronted with my own mortality by Ian. Thank you, Ian. Uh, every day more is a day less. Um, to, to Ian, I wanted to ask. I, I mean. I don't know if this is uh, if this is right, but you you seem sort of surprisingly uh, almost pessimistic about the kind of outcome of the strike uh, and its kind of limitations. And I, I take the limitations you you raise, but it seems like quite an important uh, achievement, an example of effective workers' militancy, which are certainly sort of few and far between. Although strikingly, there's actually been quite a, a few pretty important victories in the kind of COVID period. And, you know, maybe that's something to think about, you know, the, the, the construction workers, recently the kind of Liverpool victory, uh, you know, kind of a, a, at the university, like a number of quite important, quite militant uh, strikes. Um, I guess my question is about the beginning of that strike, which is why does it happen? Why is it possible for that group of workers to take on the employers over such a long period of time to such a, so, you know, you talked about high levels of strike pay. Um, but presumably there are other questions about sort of, a, you know, is it a highly organized depot? Are there levels of organization, networks, rank and file militants? You know, I mean, what's, what's going on that makes that depot so strikingly different, um, which I was sort of thinking about when you're talking about the fact that it doesn't really spread, um, which kind of raised the question, okay, so why were they able to do it in the way that kind of other depots didn't? Um, yeah, so, so maybe Dante and Matt first and then Ian. Yeah, thank you, Sai. Um, maybe me and Matt hopefully have overlapping views on this, but I guess I'd first say, say even if we are the inquiry project would simply be students also as workers, that would be politically meaningful as well, because it's just simply such a huge body of workers in such a broad range of industries. They are being treated in particular ways. 
we think that that would be meaningful purely yeah as an understanding also of things like rental practices things like international um, migration and like the movement of students globally um students simply do do lots of work this doesn't say all students are workers that's not necessarily what we're saying but more importantly we think that the inquiry would reveal that students as students are workers because necessarily the way universities utilize students now is because they do productive work whether it's on the most minimal level that our essay like student essays are sold into these platforms or whatever or they do these research work we think there's something students are workers within the category of the student it's just in some ways that's obscured and um, kind of left out so i think a student inquiry is meaningful whether or not we how we want to categorize and conceptualize students um, on a political level it's also meaningful because we could do better survey and inquiry into like the current composition of the student movements so yeah i think that's obviously different from the kind of traditional conception of workers inquiry but we think we can translate the kind of questioning and analysis that's interested in political organizing simply into the student movement as well because i think there's you know as i was trying to articulate there's lots of discourses which try to articulate politically what students can and can't be doing but if we reorient it towards a kind of understanding of the work they do and the university is a workplace for students that would be useful so i think the kind of conceptual questions about how we understand workers um students as workers we could disagree on now but in the sense that if we do the inquiry it will better reveal the way in which students are workers as students simply just to how they relate to the university but that's an open question it also as with all inquiry stuff it, the work needs to be done in inquiry first but i think that's how i'd articulate it yeah and i think i guess one key thing is um you sort of spoke about how how's it different from seeing students as workers i think part of the point of an inquiry project is is starting maybe from um the acknowledgement or perhaps just an assumption um, that students aren't uh, you know a cohesive whole uh, subjectivity they're not a coherent social force um, some students are workers and probably a lot of students are workers and do work either you know within universities or outside of them um, but not all are and how do student populations shift um, how you know how does that change um, you know what role they play in society um, what role they play in the production and reproduction of, of, of work and, and and that um so it's sort of coming from i guess criticizing this idea that um you know students and workers unite and fight well surely there are some students who have absolutely no class interest in uniting with workers and the ones that do are probably because they are engaged in, in you know that that relationship of um labor like so like selling their labor whether it's you know obfuscated or or unrecognized or whatever um it does occur to a certain extent um maybe not in the traditional sense but in a different sense and it's trying to locate how and where this happens um so we can locate um class tendencies within student populations um i think and i guess um lastly on what you're saying about uh rent strikes and why not 2010 um, I guess there's sort of two points and again, it could just be, um, us making quick assumptions to, to, to make that claim that rent strikes were the high point of recent student militancy. I guess it's partially comes from our perspective as people who didn't, um, you know, live through 2010, it's not particularly recent for us. Um, there's limited so from, from our, yeah, from our experience. That's a high point, but also I guess asking in what 2010 achieved in terms of of, of militancy, um, you know, you had a movement which, um, you know, exploded and and, you know, was militant in in the moment. Um, but what occurred from that, and I guess that's a critique of 2010, is part of the reason why we um, want to engage in this project of of student inquiry, because you had this this explosion of militancy and uh, assumably through that, a, a production of a network of militants and a militant consciousness that hasn't seemed to translate into um, the workforce today and the people who've gone from being students to workers, perhaps in very specific spheres like UCU and university work, and uh, perhaps to an extent in sort of art and cultural work uh, and some other places, uh, but more broadly, uh, it hasn't seemed to 
to have occurred in that manner and that that shift uh, has more occurred sort of into institutional spaces. Um, well, I guess asking um, what materially has have these movements achieved uh, above sort of uh, the moment they existed in uh, is important when thinking about sort of high points of modernity. And I'd say with with the rent strike stuff, um, I think there's some definitely critiques to have there. Um, but for a large part, you know, it, it uh, shifted 140 million pounds last year uh, from universities to students. Uh, it's created networks of tenant activists who are involved in tenants unions. Uh, I think that's materially um, important uh, and significant, um, perhaps compared to student movements previously. But I think that's very much open for critique too. Yeah. I'll just say one thing quickly as well that there's a difficulty in organising how to refer back to the 2010 stuff at all, because I think actually a huge amount of students simply, universities have expanded so much politically the way universities lie now, there just has been such a large transformation. And I think the main thing to say with the rent strike stuff is interesting because it was happening in parallel with the biggest set of struggles within the university on a national and local levels. So that's the main political dynamic that needs to be worked out because we can do a historical analysis of what was happening in the 2010s, but that doesn't really necessarily inform us about how students and workers relate today because um, I think there's just been such a big shift within universities and within student populations. Okay, nobody's allowed to make comments about how long ago 2010 was anymore. Um, Ian, please. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you started by saying you, you thought I was a bit negative about the outcome, and I, I guess if I was trying to encapsulate the outcome of the bus strike, it would be that it was a very, very important partial defensive victory right so you had an employer trying to do something absolutely horrendous and workers succeeded in partly fighting that off right um but the the fact that you know that that kind of encapsulates within it a big contradiction so the thing that was really trumpeted by unite as well as you know many others including by me uh, was the defeat of fire and rehire because that's been such a big part of uh, you know a, an offensive by employers to defeat that through a strike was a massively important win and it showed it was possible to do that and you know we should take inspiration from that but for the workers they went back to work and the thing that I mean, you heard from the, the brief video clip I played, the fire and hire was important to the workers and they recognised the importance of that. But they went back into work on worse terms than they came out on. You know, they had unpleasant shifts, longer working days. You know, things had got worse for them. So uh, that was a setback. And then on top of that, there were things said towards the settlement of the dispute, like, you know, so the key manager, oh, they'll be going in no time or whatever. Well, he's still there. And in the meantime, the majority of the reps have left. So there, there was quite a lot of unfinished business at the end of the strike, as there often is, that people were saying, oh, you know, we'll get back into work and we'll have to sort out some of the detail. Well, actually, when most of the reps have left, it, workers are then left feeling, well, hold on a minute. The people who told us that this was the beginning, not the end, mm, you know, where does that leave us? So um, amongst I think depending how you're looking at it, uh, you see a different picture. So from, from outside, I think the defeat of fire and rehire is the most important thing, really important lesson. But the organisation inside the workplace um, has been left weakened um, uh, by the outcome, which is, you know, obviously a really big factor we should weigh when considering the outcome of the strike. You know, how, how has it left the workers? Um, in terms of the beginning of the strike, um, I think uh, it, it's the case that union membership is very high in almost all bus depots in Britain. Um, you know, it's a very high density sector. Um, there was uh, the convener who you saw a brief clip of, Colin Hayden, had been at another bus depot where there'd been a dispute a few years ago. Um, you know, so he came in with some experience from that and quite, quite a big network within the union as well. Um, I think the decisive factor, though, was fire and rehire, because if we look at the pattern, um, there has been a shift to doing a lot more serious strike action in Britain since the 2016 Trade Union Act was passed, because that made it harder to get a strike and it limited the time you could 
during which you could take action using the ballot. So whereas in the past people might slowly escalate action, it's much more common now to say we're going to do a lot of action very quickly to try to get a result before our ballot um, expires. Um, so, you know, also in Manchester, we, we, we've been affected by the Arriva bus strike that hasn't happened yet. Um, so um, th they've decided to take continuous, indefinite action. Uh, then the employer increases the offer and then the union recommends the offer. The members reject the offer. And then they propose doing indefinite continuous action again. And then the employer <laughs> improves the offer. Um, so we're currently going through one of those cycles. So there is quite a bit of either actual or threatened continuous action. We've got Clark's uh, shoe company in the southwest that's on, I forget how many weeks they've been out now, continuous strike action. You know, there's been quite a few uh, very long and serious disputes recently that either have happened or have been, been threatened. Um, so. But the pattern we're also seeing, though, is those kind of compromises where um, <clears throat> militant action might be threatened, but then the employer offers a, a few crumbs and maybe, you know, union officials are inclined to take them and are afraid of gambling everything for, um, for a bit more. And uh, again, we can see that there's been a whole series of um, settlements that have been for pay rises that are below inflation, you know, where people have had a live strike ballot and then accepted a deal that's below inflation, which I, I just find astonishing, uh, you know, unless there's specific circumstances why, uh, why people feel they, they have to settle for that. Um, uh, but fire and rehire was, was what was applied in this case. And I, I think that was like a red line for a lot of people. It's like you bargain with the union and you, you push us back. You know, that's kind of legitimate in the eyes of a lot, a lot of people in the trade union movement. But you threatened to sack us to do that instead of bargaining. And that's like a red rag to a bull. And, and that's why they got a leverage campaign against the employer and so on. So once that was taken off the table, then the, the ability to settle for something that the workers really didn't see as very good, um, suddenly that becomes possible again once fire and rehires off the table. So I think it's that, it's that intransigence by the employer, the determination to use fire and rehire. I mean, they also tried to victimise reps. I mean, Colin, who you saw, was suspended uh, a couple of times, I think, before the strike started. And there was a strike ballot, got him, got the job, you know, got him back in work and so on. Uh, so there's all that kind of dynamic that was up in the temperature as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We're, we're sort of coming towards the, the end of our, our time. We had a, a comment from Jay uh, about anti-workerism uh, and the need to dismantle the world system. Uh, what would Ho Chi Minh do? He asks us. A slave rebellion burns down the plantation factory or, fla or factory does not seek to take over the plantation or factory uh, and calling for building systems of sub subsistence external to existing supply chains. I'll, I'll let our speakers decide whether or not they'd like to um, uh, come back to that. Um, uh, and also offer everybody an opportunity to uh, give us any parting words uh, if you are so inclined. No, everybody feels like they've said, oh, it looks like Matt wants to say something, Matt. Yeah, I guess, I guess briefly on Jay's thing, um, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I don't see how it's, uh, how it's an anti-workers point. I think a student inquiry is very much a project for the university to die but on our terms. Um, so I don't think it's for the self-management of anything. It's for complete abolition. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Sai. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so thanks so much to uh, all uh, one, two, uh, four of you, five of you. <laughs> I knew I was going to get it wrong uh, because there were two of you on the same screen. Uh, thanks to all five of you for excellent uh, uh, papers. Uh, thank you very much to Paul for running the uh, technical aspect uh, of the call. Thanks to everybody who has uh, logged in and, and participated. Uh, please uh, remember that. Uh, HM Online continues for the next uh, seven days. So uh, make sure to check out uh, the kind of upcoming events uh, on the website. Don't forget that the conference is only possible thanks to the journal. Uh, and so please do subscribe. You have a 20% uh, discount uh, for the time of the conference, as well as a 40% discount for uh, the Haymarket HM book series. And Haymarket is making the series of uh, live uh, uh, streamings uh, possible alongside us to do, do support them uh, and do support the book series. 
Uh, thank you everybody for joining us uh, and see you uh, at the next event at nine o'clock.